All righty then. So it is 7.05 on May 26th, Tuesday, for a regular governing board meeting. It's being called to order. Roll call. Uh, we have four members. Mrs. O'Brien is not here, and Miss Frank is here telephonically. So let's all stand for a pledge and stay standing for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Miss Reed. All right, I move that the governing board adopt the agenda. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 All right, all of us have voted kind of voted I we're waiting up oh, and here it is all right governing board reports miss Tweedy would you like to start I would just like to make um, either a discussion agenda request or a work session depending on how much time we think this would take so in last week when when we were discussing and we approved the, the raises, and I was talking to Mr. Miglarino about um, if, if we stayed with current year funding and, AD, and, and, and if the ADM changed, like what effects that could have on the district and depending if students were gonna come in person or online. So I would just like to understand just because I'm a little concerned because I've been having more time, so I've been doing a lot more reading. Um, in, in places where schools have reopened, they haven't necessarily had the attendance that they were anticipating, and I know it isn't our country, but I'm thinking we could very easily be down more than 1% ADM next year. So in thinking what we're doing to gather data, to see how many parents are planning on sending their kids if we're open. And, and also it'd feel better if Dr. Smith figured out, because I'm trying to think about this and I, I just don't wanna see a financial nightmare moving forward and being in a position of making any choices. But I know in the past, even when we've had grade levels that say we're over a student and we haven't filled those positions until we saw the students and counted this year it's it's a really tough position and when you look at as you're replacing people through natural attrition certain positions are only needed like bus drivers for in person and so the better data we have on that it would we can make better financial decisions that won't come back to bite us later. And, I, and just being on the board and not wanting to be in a position. So I would even go a step further and say, this is probably the most important data we would ever collect to make fiscally sound risk decisions because we've never had a school year like this. And I think we'd even need Dr. Smith to maybe say how many um, respondents we'd need to make accurate predictions in terms of staffing before we're hiring people through natural attrition and if we need to really tighten the budget until we see how many students show up so we don't have to make uncomfortable decisions later and that he makes sure even if we have to call people to get this information that we have enough data and that we could have a discussion on that data to make sure we're doing everything we can to mitigate any possible negative financial impacts if we stay with current year funding because I really am worried about this just what I've read I don't I don't see anywhere near 99 percent agreement on how to handle the coronavirus so to think that we would have 99 percent of our ADM might be very optimistic and, and I hope we do so um, what you're looking for is um, the plan um, along with the data that would give us the best overview of the students that are actually going to come back brick and mortar and have it um, separated out. Um, and and also online and... Right, separated out to whatever it is. And, and just one. So Dr. Finch, I know that um, with Nevik, you guys are working together and I believe it was Paradise Valley 
and I can't remember the other district that it has, maybe it was Scottsdale, that has sent out a survey? Is that? We got Scottsdale? a visitor. Um, yeah, we're working with Nevic, which includes Dysert, uh, Peoria, Paradise Valley. No, I know it includes them, oh. but I know that two of the districts have already sent out a parent survey, and I didn't know. If we have two as well. That's to glean. Yep. I was going to be. The information um, that you're looking for. And I would like to also, from Dr. Smith, know that we had an adequate sample size to make sound predictions. I, I just want to make sure. I, I'm really uncomfortable. I want to make sure we're doing what we need to do. And at some point, I, I know that you guys are all working on this. So when is your best guess that we would have um, the most effective and efficient session with, you're not going to have all the information because that changes on a daily basis, but at least most of the information that Ms. Tweedy is referring to. So you let us know when you think you're going to be able to have that because mm -hmm. I don't want to keep having them, no. you know, and having... Because I want to make sure, and, and, and also just to be clear, like, in my view, we should be being... I know when we approve a budget, we can spend the money, but it doesn't mean we have to, that we're saving every penny we can right now till we know what's going to happen. And if people disagree with that, then to share right. that too. Okay. So, Dr. Finch, you get the gist of what we're looking at? Yep, that was going to be in my board report. So I, oh, I can go, there go, done. go next if you want. Okay. Ms. Okay. Ms. Frank? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So I would just like to uh, follow up on Ms. Tweedy's comments. I share her concerns um, about what possibly could happen financially going forward. And I did see that uh, a district uh, comparable to size in Deer Valley and also within close proximity has already uh, put out a press release um, on their online school for K-8. They're adding it to their high schools for, um, for high school. And they have a Facebook Live event coming up where they will be recruiting parents and students. I'm assuming those parents who, who do not feel comfortable or, or may not feel comfortable sending their uh, students back to school and they advertise it's open to anyone in the state so i'm not going to mention the name of the district because i don't want to give them free advertising at our board meeting but this does concern me that if we don't have um an option for our k-8 students and i know that it, it's on the agenda later for us to, to look at um, i am concerned that we're not out ahead of this and there could be some very negative um, financial consequences. So uh, I would just like to voice um, my concerns and in support of Ms. Tweedy's comments. Um, additionally, I would like to congratulate um, all of our retirees. I'm sorry that I was unable to attend the reception, but uh, just congratulate them for all their years of service and hard-earned retirement. And then finally, I would like to thank um, all of the members of uh, Cabinet, thank Dr. Finch, everyone who's been working so hard uh, to make the end of the school year a success and really basically pivoting and turning on a dime to recreate everything we had been doing and do it a different way. So I do appreciate all of the hard work uh, that's been going on and will continue to go on through the summer. So I just wanted to express my thanks. And that's it for my board report. Thank you, Ms. Frank. Ms. Reed. Um, I just wanted to say thank you and congratulations to our retirees. Um, it was an, a, a fun event, I guess, if if you could say that that, that was um, an event. Um, but to be able to clap for our retirees that came through and um, to see cars going through the parking lot that were decorated and the unique um, ways that um, people came through the line on FaceTime and, um, you know, with with their family members. Um, so um, kudos for creativity there. Um, but just thank you for giving so much of your life to our district and to our students. Um, your dedication and um, your sacrifices over the years um, have made tremendous um, students um, for our community. So um, thank you once again. Um, I also had an opportunity to stop by um, the Bel Air um, farewell reception and um, just to see the teachers and the staff one last time and it was very well attended so thank you to um, to the Beller staff and to the administration for putting that on um, I was also able to jump on to 
um, I think it was Google Meets to um, see one of our teachers receive a Silver Apple Award. So that was really neat. Um, and just her excitement and listening to her student um, read um, the nominating essay. So congratulations, Ms. Fern. Thank you for what you do for your classroom. Um, and just a congratulations to all of our 2020 um, eighth grade promoters and our 2020 graduates. Um, it's been really fun to see how the school celebrated um, their students that were moving on and all of the creative out of the box ways that parents have been celebrating. And, um, you know, between videos and pictures and parades and, um, you know, shout outs. And it, it's just been really neat to, to watch the community come together to celebrate our students. Um, and I am looking forward to not having home learning. Woohoo! Parents celebrate. <laughs> Yay! Teachers celebrate. Um, hey, you're hurting her feelings. No. no. <laughs> Dr. Galligan and I talked, talked about it at the retirement celebration. Um, in all honesty, most of my kids stopped home learning on Monday, the last week of school, and um, I, I couldn't force them to uh, do anything else. But um, my high schooler, he, he stuck it out until like four o'clock in the morning on Thursday to get the rest of his dual enrollment assignments in. So, um, yeah, so thank you to those high school teachers who were, you know, pushing the students to the last possible minute to make sure that they met all of their requirements for dual. I appreciate that. Um, parents, you know, we had the hashtag going around, thank a DV parent. Um, parents, you guys just went above and beyond um, the last um, quarter of school. And so just a heartfelt thank you to you for um, making sure that you had everything that you needed for not being um, afraid to reach out for help to make sure that all of your um, kids' emotional needs were met. And um, I know that we had a lot of resources to be able to give. Um, teachers, thank you for all the communication you gave to parents. Um, and there was a lot of support out there just from the parent community, you know, encouraging one another, um, helping troubleshoot when passwords didn't work and things like that. So it was, um, it was neat to see how everyone was working together. So thank you and yay students, enjoy your summer. Oh, it's my turn now. Okay, thank you, Ms. Reed. So just um, to frame the rest of our meeting, know that some of the decisions or most of the decisions that are going to be made are going to be made uh, knowing that all the restrictions of um, our COVID have not been lifted yet. Anyway, it is the end of school. So congratulations to our 2020 promoters and our graduation children that will be graduating, I guess on the second and third. Um, there are people that have decorated their cars that have no students in school. That just, because there was a lady, she, I said, hey, what school, you know, is, is your, is your person and they're like oh I don't have anybody in school it's just so neat to do that for everyone because then they they look at my car and they think that I'm happy for them so it's kind of neat for people to to just step in like that um, retry, retiree drive through was awesome uh, the apples the bases the balloons and the faces of people that were able to start a new chapter was awesome and I don't think there's anyone that retired that says gosh I wish I would have waited another year I don't think so. Anyway, Bel Air's um, transition into the traditional academy at Bel Air was awesome. Uh, Principal DeTori was moving as usual, and then she was moving to her new school so she could go over there, go over there to work. Um, the extra effort um, that everyone in this room and well outside of this room has been putting in has been nothing short of astounding. Um, we just are a really flexible uh, group. And when the government decides that the bailouts and they have enough for everyone, I think education should be up there somewhere. Just going to throw that out there in case someone that's in charge of bailouts are listening. Um, Dr. Finch, on Sunday, was it Sunday? I think it was Sunday, or maybe it was Monday. I had gotten a couple of texts saying that there was a big water leak at Anthem Elementary School. And he went over and he fixed it. <laughs> So, wow, look at that. The superintendent goes out on the holiday weekend and fixes the leak. I don't know. I don't think there's a lot of them around that do that. And I guess last but not least, in a way, thank you for the news media because they have been really good at recognizing students 
and employees of education um, institutions during this whole COVID-19. Um, just, it, it's just been awesome. No matter what news channel you go to, they're doing some something to say, hey, thanks a lot um, for the educators. So let me make sure I didn't forget anyone. I don't think so. Dr. Finch, now that we already took half your report, go with the rest of it. No, thank you. Um, but uh, before I start, I'll uh, do a little commercial for our system. We have a commercial. brand new system, and that's we're arm wrestling with today. Um, but it, and for anyone that's watching, you can also get the uh, the powerpoints are always in board docs if you can't um, see them on the screen. But we are going to attempt tonight to use it uh, to toggle between the two, and so hopefully you will be seeing what we see inside the the room here as we do our. Um, celebrations right after my short commercial but oh, we're getting looking forward to that hopefully it works and our system won't puke <laughs> because it has that's why we were late getting started we had to restart it so it's a brand new system we're still figuring it out and uh, we'll, we'll get there um, there was a question about uh, what are we doing in relationship to um, getting ready for next year as I've shared in the update I'll share with everyone here too and with legislators and uh, county officials etc governor um, we plan with the uh, NEVIC, uh, that's our eight school consortium, for lack of a better word, uh, to have a decision um, on which model we're going to use in early July. So um, that's the, the goal, because obviously many things will happen in the next 30, 40 days. So uh, we hope to actually pick a model by then. Um, during that week and a week before that or 10 days before that, we'll do all those surveying what you're talking about. We've already surveyed once um, and was more around home learning because if we have to come back to the home learning, um, we want to make sure we have it uh, in tip top shape. So we've kind of covered that and we'll be sharing that data with you um, later, uh, probably next next month, I think, um, is when we're going to do it at the first board meeting. It was really good. It showed uh, where weaknesses were, where our strengths were, and uh, some things that we can adjust to be ready for next time. So um, in general, the the plan is a survey 10 days week before um, we make a decision to collect that data to decide uh, make some good decisions on whether uh, which model would be the best and obviously in concert with our, our NEVIC other NEVIC superintendents and uh, EFRG is another group we have that um, reaches a little bit further we work with them as well on um, some some of the models that are coming out one of one indicator could be Chandler, uh, because Chandler has to start, they're on a year-round, modified year-round schedule, so they have to start early. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. So um, that might be a player um, in our decision-making as well. But So we plan to collect that data that you're looking for um, as it gets closer. Collecting the data now would not make any sense uh, because it's 40 days from, um, from when we really need to make a decision. And so um, that we plan, so it'll be a late June is when we'll collect it and that'll be hot off the press. And hopefully we get good numbers and it tells us which direction to go and we'll go from there. So that's kind of the, the latest, yeah. Sure. Okay, can you just explain to me why you think 100% of the population will agree with what model you choose in Deer Valley? So that uh, we don't no, lose I've any ADM? I've been doing for 22 years and no 100% on any decision I've ever made. All right, when we look at enrollment, though, during a pandemic, um, I, and I'm not going to politicize this or or say my own view, I can't find two people that agree. Oh, I agree. Uh, in order for us not to have a financial catastrophe as, next year, and, and ultimately that stops with the board, what, what I'm hearing, and, and I guess what isn't making sense to me, is first of all one of the neighboring districts is recruiting everyone to that doesn't want to send themselves in person to go and enroll in their online school right now so they're basically looking at taking people's enrollment who are going to do this um so is I, I mean everyone else so is too. if we don't offer an option right. that is not in person then anyone who doesn't agree with you if you go in person is lost adm and we cannot survive that Right. Uh, if it's more than 1%. Uh, also, when we look at staffing, 
this is a district and I'm getting extremely uncomfortable as a board member because it's like watching a bus getting ready to hit someone and nobody wants to move out of the road. Um, it, when, when, secondly, it's like when we look at even having a fifth grade class three over, we don't hire the teacher. We could easily absorb the cost of having one extra teacher, but we don't do that. We wait and count the whites of their eyes. There are several positions in this district that are contingent on people attending in person. If we overhire those positions and we don't get the ADM and we stay on current year funding, I do not want to sit here and get crucified for the decisions we're going to have to make. I would like to honor our commitment and that data is extremely important to have to make fiscally sound decisions. And, and I'm getting really exasperated that people don't seem to see this. Yeah. No, I don't disagree with you. That's exactly what I was saying. I don't think you were listening. Um, we are going to be, hybrid is one of the models and tonight we are adding K-8 the rest of our system. We were one of the first to, to put online in the in the state anyway. And so we're just uh, formalizing it tonight. Um, so we will have K-12 option available. So um, we are, what I'm saying is we will make a decision on what model seems the best for the district. And it may be a hybrid. It may be totally virtual. When it you may say be, a model, though, yeah. I'm saying the odds that 100% of the population will go with the same model Correct. in the fall is about zero. I'm not disagreeing with you. So what if we choose hybrid? What if we choose well, virtual? Uh, okay. Just so we have you're the making same, assumption that I'm going to be breaking mortars. What you're making just so assumption. just so we have similar definitions. Yep. Hybrid means part of the class is in person, parts online. That would only make sense to offer if we had to do um, smaller class sizes. Uh, virtual would be the whole things online, and in person would be the whole things in person. Not necessarily. I mean, so. that's what I'm saying. The definition of a hybrid class is, unless I have that incorrect. Yeah, there's different ways you can do it. But that is one example, yes. So are you saying you're going to offer an in-person option and a not in-person option? Because I keep saying you we say, well, today. you're saying the words will pick one, which sounds like you're going to offer one. We do that today. We offer um, online today t for our students. So we are going to continue to offer online. But for a majority of the students, we aren't going to make that decision until July early July. So you don't need to know how many people are going to attend online to have responsible staffing. We're just going to keep hiring the same number of bus drivers without that data and, and the same number of cafeteria workers. No. We, Ms. Moffin can fill yeah. us in here, but what happens is when we, um, when we know the data and we choose model X, whatever X is, it'll determine staffing, how we should or should not now respond. We have a lot of smart people in this room and you saw it on when we switched from uh, brick and mortar to virtual basically overnight and became really a state leader. And you have to have a little faith that we know we can do it again and make and make the right choice. So Ms. Tweedy, would you be comfortable if um, we would get <clears throat> in an update the different models that we might go through? Because to me, I thought, I mean, I think hybrid could be uh, if you don't want to go step foot in the in the room, we can do a K through 12 now, or we will be doing a K through 12. Um, so you could do that as an online school, or you could attend hybrid. You could be the one that goes to, mm -hmm. um, you know, go to school. But in a way, we already have that. But what we're adding is the K8 part of it. So that right. would have to be rolled out, pushed out, yeah. and... And, and all NEVIC schools are going to do that, right. not just so, us. So maybe if we got the different ideas that, um, or plans, strategies, that we may em employ that would make it easier to understand and then connect um, staffing and funding to whatever those models are. Yeah, I'm, I trying mean, to, I'm trying to understand the information from... I everybody. guess, yeah, I, I guess I'd like to see, and I think we're collecting the data too late because it makes a difference in staff things. Also, you would need a really big sample, like a, a way higher response than we typically get for surveys to make decent predictions. And if these predictions are off, it is going to have huge financial repercussions to every employee and student in this district. And I, 
I don't want to be in that position. And and I. I That's my job. That's what I do. Oh. Okay. No, you know what my job. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I was trying to. I don't know if you can see me putting my hands up, but I was trying to get it where you could speak. Go ahead, Ms. Frank. And I didn't mean to uh, interrupt you. So, yeah, so uh, I have the same question that Ms. Tweedy had, and, and I would just like to, to your point, Dr. Finch, you do have a lot of smart people in the room. You also have some very smart people on your board, and Ms. Tweedy, you know, is actually not only my friend, but one of the smartest people I know. And her question is perfectly valid. My question is, are you going to offer... Assuming schools open up, brick and mortar, and an online option. I mean, you talk about different models. We'll pick one. And I was listening to what you said, and to me that sounded like it's one choice or the other. You need to have an online option, not just for the parents who may not want to send their kids back to school, but we have medically fragile students. We have students with asthma. We have students with diabetes. And those students may need not to be in a brick and mortar classroom. So are you planning to offer an online K-8 Dr. Finch, for our could, students next year and for those parents who would prefer to choose that? That's why we're asking for permission tonight to be K-8. Yeah, Ms. Frank, if we could, on the agenda. Ms. Tweedy, if we could wait until it, it's uh, the agenda item where Dr. Galligan will talk about it, that would be, I think, okay. a more appropriate okay. place for that. Um, is that okay? That's okay with me. Thank you, Mrs. Ordway. Thank you, Dr. Finch. Because then um, Dr. Galligan can can get all the way into it. Anymore? Or, or are we moving to COVID? No, I, I, to I understand Ms. Tweedy's angst. That's totally logical. Um, there was a lot of angst done when we switched from brick and mortar to this. Um, yes, all of our Nevik brothers and sisters are doing the same thing. We're all expanding um actually everyone in the whole state is doing that expanding k-12 um if they're not they're going to end up in what she's talking about in a scenario where they uh, will be disconnected here's the variable that's different though that i believe um if you're going to go to primavera let's just use them for example we don't accept their credits um, unless they come in and take our exams uh, for our for our core classes so in general, people aren't going to leave that. So would they leave a neighbor from our from this district for a neighbor if they live in our district? And I don't see that unless we unless to her point we don't offer that service. But um, it's harder to jump between districts because they're in a different sequence, et cetera, et cetera, different curriculum mapping, and parents um, they know that. And so I I don't I I do see um, that we we definitely need to collect data to get a good um, good, make a good decision. I understand that. Um, and we will, we'll make a good decision and it may have multiple variables to it, but I'm working with Nevik and the legislators and the governor to figure out kind of what the temperature is. But in about 30 days, we'll know a lot more than we know today. Thank you. Whose turn is it now? Oh, not you. you we'll do Paula next. For it. All right. Awards okay. and recognition. Dr. Dr. Tunis. All right. Good evening. Tonight we have our final awards and recognition for this school year. Although our honorees aren't here in the room, we will celebrate them virtually now and soon on social media. Certificates and logo pins will be mailed to each honoree. We begin with Boulder Creek High School senior Tristan Hubbard, who received a state decathlon gold medal in music. <laughs> the Arizona Academic Decathlon is a 10-event scholastic competition for high school students. Students compete in art, economics, essay, interview, language and literature, mathematics, music science, social science, and speech. The competition pushes participants to master college-level material and practice skills like public speaking. Congratulations to State Academic Decathlon Gold Medalist Tristan Hubbard and his advisor, Elizabeth Erickson. <laughs> Next, we honor our Air Force Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps Cadets. Deer Valley High School Air Force JROTC received this Distinguished Unit Award for the 2019-2020 school year. 
This award recognizes units that have distinguished themselves through outstanding service to their school community. Congratulations to Deer Valley High School's Major Vaughn Whited and Master Sergeant Danila Stilchin and their cadets on receiving the Distinguished Unit Award. <laughs> Sandra Day O'Connor Air Force J JROTC cadets earn the Distinguished Unit with Merit Award for their outstanding service to their school community. The with merit honor can only be achieved every three years with the HQ inspection when the HQ inspection occurs. The OHS unit also received the Silver Star Community Service with Excellence Award for their sixth year in a row, all six years of this award's existence. This award recognizes the 68 community service events accumulating 4,150 hours. This averages out to 33 hours for each of the 125 total cadets in the unit. Congratulations to Sandra Day O'Connor High School's Master Sergeant Mike Beatty and his cadets on receiving the Distinguished Unit with Merit and the Silver Star Community Service Excellence Awards. <laughs> Once again, we are honoring Barry Goldwater High School's Culinary Arts Program. Chef Ryan Mathis and Esther Skinner received the Association for Career and Technical Education of Arizona Outstanding CTE Program of the Year Award. The award recognizes a CTE program whose members have demonstrated leadership and made significant and unique contributions for students at their schools. Congratulations to Chef Ryan and Chef Esther and the BGHS Culinary Arts Program on being named Arizona's Outstanding CTE Program of the Year. The Healthy Arizona Worksite Award is given to businesses and organizations making an impact both within and beyond their walls, addressing one or more of the many healthy challenges impacting communities across the state. Deer Valley Unified School District recently received the Healthy Arizona Worksite Award at the gold level. DVUSD's vision to create a wellness program that promotes all aspects of health and provides resources to employees in an easy manner to educate them to make healthier decisions and in turn reduce the risk of developing a chronic disease. DVUSD implemented the WellStyle Wellness Program, which is a free benefit for employees who currently have medical benefits through the district. The program gives employees the tools they need to make simple lifestyle changes. Congratulations to the Healthy Arizona Arizona Worksite Gold Award Team, Food and Nutrition Wellness Specialist Danielle Anderson, Benefits Bookkeeper Janae Zimbri, Human Resources Personnel Development Coordinator Julie, Judy Williams, Payroll Benefits Director Chris Costanza, and Valley Schools Wellness Director Kendall Taylor. <laughs> that concludes. Oh, that's it. <laughs> that concludes tonight's awards and recognitions. Shall we clap for Dr. Tunis? Yay, thank you. Oh, I are, are you saying something to us, Dr. Gary? Is it your turn? Yay. Yes, it is. Okay, good evening. There you go, you clicked. Okay, we're ready to go. Good evening, President Ordaway. Excuse me, members of the board, Dr. Finch. It's my pleasure to present the COVID-19 update uh, as we have been doing for uh, the past couple months. Our agenda for today uh, is similar. We have some sunshine stories that we would like to share with you. Uh, we'll give you some department updates and then like we always do, field uh, your questions. Okay, our first sunshine story uh, comes from Bel Air, and a couple of you already commented in your uh, board reports about your attendance there. But on Friday, May 22nd, we provided the opportunity for the teachers and staff at Bel Air to have some closure regarding the conversion of Bel Air into the traditional school. Dr. Finch and I provided some brief remarks at the beginning, and then Principal DeTore spoke for approximately 10 to 15 minutes and highlighted the contributions of many Bel Air staff members and also she highlighted the strong role that Bel Air has played in the community. 
Principal DeTore was thanked by staff members at the end. We believe it was a positive experience as evidenced by the many comments and emails that we received afterwards. Gail, sunshine story number two. Certainly. So sunshine number two story comes to us from O'Connor High School and it is from a student um, who graduated this year, but she was um, writing a letter to her dual enrollment teacher. And this is just a short portion of about a two and a half page letter. And her mother, who um, is a, a staff member at that school, said she doesn't like to write, but she felt compelled to share information about her experience with her dual enrollment teacher all year, but especially during the school closure. And I think the last sentence says it all here. I can confidently say Miss Anderson is the only teacher I have met that excels at both educating and connecting. And we know how important it was for our teachers to connect with our students over the last 10 weeks. And they did a phenomenal job. And this is just a recognition from a student for her teacher. Thank you, Gail. Sunshine story number three comes from Jenna. So the third story focuses on our retirement reception, which the majority of uh, the people in this room had the opportunity to participate. We were unsure how this would go, and as you know, we, we prepared it as we were closing in on the year. We wanted to make sure that we did do something for these wonderful people that have dedicated their careers and their lives and their time to this profession. So I, I just I want to add that we have 91 retirees so far at the end of this year, and we had um, equal participation at this event, if not a little bit better, actually, than we had at, at our traditional retirement reception. We also received um, a lot of positive feedback from all of those driving through, from the principals that came through as well. They enjoyed the opportunity to visit a little bit and um, also for the walkthrough option. So thank you to all of you that came. Thank you, Jenna. And then our final sunshine story is with Jim. Uh, not so much a story or a narrative as a couple pictures. I uh, just wanted to celebrate some of the construction that uh, is going on. Uh, those that were at the, the Bel Air function on Friday got kind of a sneak peek. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Finch for uh, me uh, using your pictures. Um, the picture on the left is the traditional school at Bel Air. It'll be the, the, the new front entryway that you can see is being um, uh, part of the modernization project um, and the lower left uh, corner um, we were uh, swinging AC units up onto the roof uh, on that day as well. Uh, on the right hand side is the Union Park School. You can see it's really taking shape. It almost starts to look like the rendering from the drone picture that you mm -hmm. see there, uh, but that's an actual picture uh, because we're that far along uh, with the construction um, and we actually have power at the site now. Um, uh, we, we've had temporary power, but we actually have permanent power at, at the site now. In the lower right hand corner is the front uh, office or entryway as you're starting to come in. So you can see some of the color palette that the architect has selected for uh, for the campus. Uh, but just wanted to celebrate that the construction projects are continuing um, and we actually have accelerated some of that work at uh, uh, the Bel Air Modernization Project. And we are currently, we never like to say this uh, publicly, so we are tracking uh, as we expected. We don't want to say that we're any more or any less when it comes to the schedule. But uh, uh, just some some of the uh, sunshine stories that are related to construction that's ongoing. Thank you, Jim. Okay, and now for some of our department updates. So to start with ALS, we have three areas that we want to uh, speak to you about tonight. Uh, the first is brief, and it's about the end of the year procedures and events. The second is also brief with our communications review of what we have been communicating with parents and how we will do so going forward. And then our third topic is more lengthy. That's our return to play athletics. And so we will go into some detail uh, as far as how we plan to resume activities with athletics with you tonight. Okay, as far as closing the school year, uh, we believe that in general, for the most part, we had a very successful uh, end of the school year. As you know, folks were working and working and working to make sure that those procedures were followed and that it was safe for our families to come and do the end of the year procedures. And so that was also coupled with our senior checkout, as again with our seniors getting their diplomas, getting their covers, and getting the information that they need for the graduation ceremony. So we were thankful for uh, the efforts that all the staff put in uh, for that and for our families. 
eighth grade promotions as well. We received quite a bit of positive feedback um, on our promotions. If you didn't know, there are two of us in here that had an eighth grader that promoted. So that's one of them's over there, Dr. T uh, and myself. And so uh, both of us interestingly commented after it was over that because it was more intimate, it was it was a unique type of ceremony um, that we were able to celebrate with our with our children. And so probably one that we wouldn't have been able to do because we probably would have been with many more folks um, that night. But it was it was a nice night to have some uh, conversation with our with our students who are promoting on. But in general, we heard pretty good feedback from that. Um, our students did receive the videos and also their promotion certificates. With our graduation ceremony, uh, the two ticket limit has not changed. I know that there is some chatter out there about that as far as some folks who are trying to put some pressure on State Farm as far as increasing that limit both within our district and other districts. Um, but as of right now, that limit has not changed. And then finally with our travel, um, I know that there have been some questions about the staff and student travel. And so just wanted to remind the board on the process that um, we have been using heretofore. So as we have indicated already, the only travel that we are putting forth now is travel that is refundable. When we submit travel to you, we are in essence asking for approval to make them eligible to travel. Um, we are only traveling, and again, as I have indicated before, if the local and state health agents deem it safe um, to do so. And so we are in constant communication with Maricopa County Department of Health and the Department of Health Services for the state. And so if they say it's um, safe to do so, then that's when we are saying it's uh, safe to do so as well. If they do not say it's safe, those trips are canceled and they are not allowed um, to proceed. At this current point in time, we have no travel in June, um, both for students and staff. That has been canceled uh, because the current guidelines right now are such that it is still it is not safe to do so. In July, we are only considering in-state travel for the students. And again, only if the local and state health agencies at the time say that it's okay to, um, to proceed. Staff travel is a bit more complicated in July due to the fact that sometimes conferences and trainings get um, situated in a location right near the border. And some of the conferences that have been canceled or postponed in March, in April, in May, and June, some of them have put tentative uh, dates in July uh, for that. And again, they are tentative saying if state health agencies deem it appropriate and safe to do so, that they would continue on. But in short, um, the travel for the staff, too, will be se severely limited to perhaps none at all. We look at updated information uh, basically in two-week cycles because we know it changes. And so there's about a 14-day cycle for the data dashboards to be updated um, and then to make those decisions for that. But safety is certainly a, a priority for us. Okay, as far as communications, uh, we did... I can say we had our daily parent update for quite some time, uh, and that required quite a bit of work, um, but we believe it was something that was valued by our parent community, uh, so they could expect to hear that daily communication as far as some of the important uh, components there. So uh, Monica and I, we collaborated quite a bit. There were others at the table here as well uh, that would jump in and provide support. For our last week, they were quite lengthy, our parent updates, because there was so much information to share. We provided them the reminders on important topics such as grading. We provided a special message to our seniors as well on the last day. We continue to update them on the social emotional webinars that we provide. If you are following in the news, which I know you are, the social emotional component is being emphasized so heavily as far as its importance when we come back to school. And so we look to continue to do these webinars for our parents to make sure that they have the tools that they need to help support their students uh, when we resume school in August. And we also informed our parents about summer communication. And so I did insert it in the board update, uh, but in case you didn't see it, uh, on Mondays, beginning on June 1st, we will have weekly parent updates. And so each Monday before the day's out, we will post or email or both um, to our parents with new information. And then finally, we have athletics, as that's the bigger topic for tonight. And I'll get to that in just a second. So thank you, DV Parent. That was also mentioned in the board update. That really was a big success for us. If you um, 
followed that hashtag, there were hundreds and hundreds of postings from our uh, schools thanking our parents, recognizing the contributions that they made during the school closures. And so we, we truly are very thankful uh, to that group for uh, their support, their assistance, and their confidence right, in us um, as we move through the school closure time. Okay, so now with ath athletics, uh, Mr. Warner and I, we will tag team uh, throughout this final part of ALS. And so uh, just to kind of set the stage, so with the NEVIC uh, calls that Dr. Finch has described, we have recently began the talks as far as which districts are going to resume athletic play for the high school students. And so we are in conversation with those districts and many districts outside of NEVIC as well are following suit and beginning to resume athletics in June. And so we wanted to update you on our procedures and how we are approaching that uh, in tonight's presentation. So for athletics, it is a phased re-entry and it's through a staged approach. And so that's the word that um, Mr. Warner is using to describe it because we already have words like phase and, and, and other similar words from some of our White House guidelines and state. And so we're looking at this again as at least, I believe it's four stages that um, Scott will talk about tonight. As far as the when, we communicated to the parents last week that it could start as early as June 1st be next Monday, but we also indicated to the parents that if it needs to be delayed, then we would communicate that uh, to the parents. So right now, those are the three most likely dates that we um, believe that we would start. And so it, June 3rd is perhaps the most likely, but any of those three, um, it could be, again, we're in communications and Scott will go into more detail on that um, later. As far as the why, gyms are permitted to be open in phase one of the White House guidelines. Uh, Superintendent Kathy Hoffman from the state also sent the letter to the districts indicating that it's local decision uh, beginning June 1st as far as how they want to reopen and resume operations. And we also have a decision tree that has been given to us from the CDC. And that's on the next slide. And we're going to take a look at that in just a second. And that decision tree is very important because that provides the prompts for us to look at and to ask ourselves, are we ready? Are we prepared to do what is required in order to reopen? And then finally, this is important too as far as what is going to be permitted. And so I, I know Scott is going to make it clear too, but just in case folks um, that didn't know, on Monday, June 1st or Wednesday, June 3rd, the football team is not going to be engaging in tackling drills um, and the full uh, suit there, okay? That it is conditioning only is what will be um, allowed in the first stage. And so there will be no close contact with, um, with our student athletes. And that will be for all the sports except those where there is no close contact involved in the regular competition. And we put those examples that are up there. So here is the decision tree for, um, that has been provided by the CDC. And so they published this decision tree to assist school districts in determining when and how to reopen safely. We believe that we are in a position to answer yes or answer yes very soon in the next uh, 72 hours to the questions that are um, on here. The CDC has also published the considerations for youth sports. We have reviewed these guidelines in detail and are using them to inform our next steps. Our district athletic director, Scott Warner, has been in frequent dialogue with our school's athletic directors about these guidelines. Numerous Zoom meetings have occurred where we have talked about these safety guidelines and protocols and how they will be implemented. These meetings continue every day for the rest of this week and into next week as we monitor our progress on these, on these action items. As far as what we will provide and what the schools will provide. Scott, do you want to go into that some? Sure. So um, our plan for the, uh, the, the getting back to uh, ready to play and getting back to play is uh, we have some things that the district is going to provide to our schools. Um, direction and guidance for our, our schools and parents, uh, extra hand sanitizer stations at our high schools, which have already been installed um, in and around the athletic uh, areas. Um, proper cleaning procedure training uh, is going to happen for our student athletes. Uh, we have a, a specific kind of uh, um, 
cleaning solution that they're going to use with the microfiber cloth that uh, they're able to clean their equipment down when they finish with it. Um, COVID-19 symptom awareness for um, our coaches for sure, but also our athletes. Um, we'll have a uh, procedure in place for if a student athlete or staff or coach uh, becomes ill or presents symptoms. Um, and then uh, we'll have a plan for if we know that someone was on campus or had close contact with someone on campus, um, what our plan will be that. And we'll also continue monitoring um, every day uh, with the uh, student athletes coming in. So we have a, a checkout that we're requiring each school um, to provide these things to us um, before we would give them a go ahead. So. Um, we want a daily schedule for each sport for the first two weeks, which staggered start times ideally, uh, matching cleaning schedules that uh, they can go in between sessions, the roster of student athletes scheduled to participate, and their location since they'll be on campus. Um, written communications are going to go to the parents from both the uh, athletic director at the school as well as the coaches. Um, we'll have that proper cleaning procedure training for coaches, staff, and student athletes. We'll have to have make that happen before kids are back. Um, we'll have a schedule of supervision and monitoring uh, with our administrators to make sure that our coaches and teams are complying with our uh, guidelines. Uh, we're going to provide uh, face masks for our coaches. Um, we are going to create proper signage essentially regarding hand washing and COVID-19 uh, symptoms and we're going to get that posted at every uh, high school. Um, as I said, we'll have some. Uh, we'll have a plan for on each campus where the where someone who might become ill um, will be taken to be isolated, and how we'll get them back to where they need to go. Uh, again, we'll reconfirm with our coaches that they're comfortable with understanding uh, the basics of the COVID-19 uh, symptom awareness. Um, we're also going to offer virtual conditioning. Um, we know that there'll be uh, students whose parents are not comfortable with them coming back to school yet. So uh, we're going to make sure that they have that opportunity to, to enjoy some uh, uh, conditioning tips and uh, routines if they can't be get back at school with the, with the rest of the players. And as again, we've all replaced the sanitizer dispensers at the schools. So stage one. Stage one, uh, we're proposing to start early June. Uh, Dr. Z talked about the three uh, dates we're zeroing in on. Um, we expect this to be a two week minimum uh, participation by our, our teams. A lot of kids have not been working out. So we wanna make sure our athletes are back in shape and a better in, in condition. Um, we're proposing conditioning and weight training only. Um, we're gonna make sure they share no equipment. That means water bottles, that means towels, that means footballs even. Um, they, won't be, they, won't be changed, they won't be trading uh, equipment with each other. Um, we're only allowing one athlete per weight rack in the weight rooms. Um, and so in, they'll have to clean their weights um, before the next session comes into the weight room. So it would be something like a 45 minute session, 15 minute cleaning, and then the next group could come into the weight room before that. Um, we're expecting them to follow all social distancing guidelines. The six feet thing that you've been hearing, um, that's our expectation for our athletes in, the, in stage one. Um, and generally we're expecting groups of no, no more than 20, um, uh, to make sure that we are having proper social distancing occurring, whether it's on the field, in the gym, or in the weight room. Um, so stage one, uh, just a couple more, uh, I think Dr. Z mentioned it, but those kinds of uh, sports that can achieve uh, proper social distance um, can proceed just as normal. Um, that, so for instance, golf has always been, it's been allowed throughout the shutdown. Cross country can easily social distance. Tennis, if they use marked tennis balls, so they don't share the tennis balls, they can play uh, uh, around a tennis. We'll not be opening the locker rooms and we'll be shutting down the drinking fountains. Uh, again, we're not sharing, they're uh, allowing them to share those kinds of facilities. Uh, we're gonna promote frequent hand washing and the use of the hand sanitizer throughout the workouts. Um, and we're gonna limit the uh, activity for each of the athletes to two hours a day. So that's stage one. Stage two, it's a mid-June targeted start. Uh, we'll, we'll allow non-contact drills, groups of no more than 10. Groups of up to 50 may be present in the same space, but it should be broken into groups of 10. Um, groups must remain the same throughout the practice. So in other words, the same 10 uh, football players, for instance, would be in the group for the entire practice. Um, that would allow us to have contact tracing should something uh, occur. Um, each weight rack may have up to three athletes. Uh, we're actually going to propose they put the spotters on each side. If you've ever uh, seen a, a weight room, usually the spotter is behind the, um, uh, the athlete lifting heavy weights. Uh, we're going to propose the spotters on the side. There'll be less uh, chance of uh, passing droplets to each other. Um, 
The sports equipment may be shared, but they have to be between between sessions. So now baseball players can throw baseballs to each other. Football players can throw footballs to each other. But we're proposing that we wipe those that equipment down between the, before the next session comes out. Um, again, no personal equipment needs to be shared. We, we want to, are not going to be uh, having water stations. Um, they need to bring their towels. They need to bring their batting helmets. Um, they need to bring their water bottles. All those things need to come from home. Um, and they're not, they're not going to share them with each other. Um, again, still no locker rooms and no drinking fountains. Uh, we expect kids to come show up uh, ready to participate. They won't be changing out and then going out to the field. Uh, no locker rooms, no drinking fountains. And again, still no more than two hours a day. We're, we're looking at heat acclimatization as well going on for our athletes in the summertime too. So we want to make sure that um, uh, over anxious coaches uh, don't keep them out there too long because they haven't got to coach them for, very, for as long as they wanted to. So that's stage two. And I would just add, Scott, too, that those group sizes are consistent with phase two of the White House guidelines uh, for reopening America. So stage three, we have an early July targeted start. Um, contact sports may begin to integrate competition within these guidelines. So, again, the, the guidelines here are we're not back to normal yet, but we can get more people on the field at a time. So baseball and softball can play nine on nine with separate dugouts for both teams. So it won't have 18 kids in one dugout. You'd have nine kids in one dugout, nine kids in another dugout, um, or no more than 15 in a dugout at any time. Football may begin to play seven on seven with teams on separate sidelines. Uh, no more than 20 on a sideline and involve groups of no more than 20 in team drills. Uh, wrestlers must submit contract and drills and competition in the same group of no more than four wrestlers per practice, and they should remain the same group throughout the practice. Uh, basketball may be played on five on five games and have whole team drills with no more than 20 players in the gym at a time. And other groups, uh, which are low and moderate risk uh, for contact, uh, can proceed in groups of no more than 20. So at every stage, and at stage four, which is not up here, stage four would be just a return to what where all of this happened. So that really is um, what stage four is. So at all stages, um, every athlete returns a specific signed COVID-19 waiver, including the, included in the wa waivers and pledge to stay home if they're symptomatic. Um, families uncomfortable with returning, returning students to campus will suffer no consequences, and we will make sure we follow up with our ADs to make sure that they, they understand that that, that can't be a consequence for our, for our families. Uh, we're going to require masks for our coaches. Um, and we're also, again, mentioning that we're providing virtual workouts for the athletes who um, families want to, want them to stay home. Thank you, Scott. So uh, that concludes the part for uh, ALS. G Gary, can um, we just take a break and go backwards now because sure. the next three might. Sure. Um, I, I have two things I wanted to, and if anyone else has anything. Uh, the communication to the parents has been <clears throat> awesome we have suffered a couple of losses in the last couple of days and um the quickness of the information along with the um help um has been very much appreciated by the students and the families um going to i know we were talking about athletics but i wonder since we may not have our marching bands going um, away to camp if we are working with Anna Backstrom to make sure that there's space and availability for the marching bands to share with athletics because nobody wants to be outside when it's 500 degrees. In yeah. fact, the instruments melt sometimes yeah. along with their lips. Yes, yeah, so President Ordway, the answer to that is yes. And so I believe Scott even today um, set up a conversation with um, Anna uh, to make sure that Basically, similar safety procedures and protocols will be in place for uh, the band members as well uh, when they resume. Also with the sharing of the insides of the facilities, because sometimes there's a little bit of a, with that. So I just want to We've heard of that sure in other that, districts. Pardon me, sir? We've heard of that in other districts before. <laughs> so, yeah. Just saying, I, I just want to make sure that um, the band parents know these things are going to be available for their students, too. Yes. Okay. Mrs. Ordway, I had a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you mentioned locker rooms will be closed. Uh, what are the, are, will there be any bathroom facilities? Uh, yes, we'll have a bathroom available to the, the, the students, athletes that are there, um, and we're actually working with Plant Forman to set up a cleaning schedule, a regular cleaning schedule that's more comprehensive for those particular bathrooms. Okay. What about ventilation? Because one of the concerns I've been reading about is one of the higher risk areas are areas with poor ventilation. 
because droplets can stay circulating in the air if with no place to go but to stay in that area. Um, is ha, have there been any thought given as to we? I mean, I hate to say leaving the door open because it's a bathroom, but um, how, how will those rooms be ventilated? Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're talking about large spaces. So we're ta talking about a gym or ox gym. Our weight rooms are large. And then the other option for the, for the players will be, to be on, the, on the track or on the, on, in the stairs. And so, um, and really in the first stage, we're really limiting the number of kids who can be in the weight room um, or in the gym. Uh, you know, we're used to having 50 or 60 kids in a gym. We can have, you know, 60 kids in a weight room at any given time. So um, we're really bringing that way down to, to, um, uh, to uh, make sure that oh. we're uh, Oh, yeah. My concern wasn't with the gymnasiums because they are large and have very high ceilings. My concern was more with the ventilation in the bathroom. Yes. And I'm sure you'll be limiting the number of students who can go in at a time that if it's, it's an area that's not well ventilated, one kid goes in, coughs, comes out, another kid goes in, the aerosols are still circulating around in the air there. Right. Yeah, and so... But uh, just, just a thought, I don't know if there's a way to better ventilate those bathrooms, but that was just a thought that occurred to me. Sure, and we'll be limiting to the number of athletes who can go to the bathroom at a particular time too, so that you know, ideally that won't um, it won't be an issue for us. But uh, it's a fair point. So we will Thank make you. sure the restrooms are not a place to congregate. Okay, Miss Tweedy, you didn't yell as loud as Jenny did. So my question was pertaining to student travel. Um, so I read the CDC guidelines, and I know that they. They put um, when feasible or whatever other ridiculous for anything that obviously nobody could do. Um, but my question pertaining to school travel, clearly I think the CDC, are the students taking buses? And if so, I mean, I don't, I've never seen so few bus uh, travelers that we could have them skipping rows and put one in the center of each row or anything like that. So if they were, do we anticipate getting guidance from the state on how we're going to do bus safety? Because to me, it's not just a matter of travel. If we're using buses, then we need some safety direction on what we're doing with bus. Yes, uh, President Ordway, Ms. Tweedy. So I, I would call that, I guess, part of the, the package as far as when we're looking at approving something or not. So when we are, there could be some folks maybe putting in for buses. Uh, I, I, I would assume, Scott, that many of the schools do that for some of the uh, in-state travel, right, that they do. And so that would be part, Ms. Tweedy, of what we would look at with the county and the state as far as, again, what is safe. And so if they are determining that safe, uh, then we would do so. If not, then we would not do so. Again, I would just reiterate to Ms. Uh, Ms. Tweedy, that uh, at this point in time, if we were making the decisions right now for someone to travel, that they, the answer would be no, because it is not safe for them to do so, uh, deemed by the county. So, okay, so so I guess because what, what, what you'd referenced initially was um, before we we look into student or staff travel, we're seeing if it's travels okay. But I guess I would, what I'm seeing as at least what I'm seeking clarification on. It's one thing to be safe to travel, meaning your family's going somewhere. And it's another thing for us to get recommendations of how we can transport students on the bus. So my two cents would be even if it's okay to travel, it's not okay for us to do bus trips as a district until we get some guidance on that and we know we're able to do best practices. Yeah, I, I They would, would have to I find would another way. And that would also include though, if we need a bus and we're staying overnight, so that would include lodging, whether it's a cabin or or a hotel room. So all of that is Correct, part overnight. of what you're right. looking at. Correct. Correct. Okay. And 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 specifically because when I looked at the CDC guidelines, they wanted to restrict extracurricular activities. It seemed like, and and maybe that isn't what the states. I hope that's not, not what the states going to come up with. So do we anticipate the state giving us guidance on any of this? Yes, I do. And do you have any idea when? 
Well, they're providing it every day. So when I call them, I, they'll <laughs> give me, they, they give me, they will talk to me and we will talk about the various counties that are in the state. And, but as of right now, we haven't approved anyone to go. So uh, this was more, I, I'm more referencing back in March when this was still evolving, the situation. And so when we were looking at trips that were coming up, that is how we went through it. We would go through the counties, we would look to see what they were recommending, what they weren't recommending to do, and then making the decision from there. So we, are we anticipate though getting an actual document about busing and extracurricular activities and, and oh, I do, and I do think some of that will come. The state is planning to release uh, by the end of this week or early next week. I had heard as early as Friday uh, an emergency plan that they are looking to provide to districts that will have uh, guidance, and so we believe that some of that will be on there. Okay, thank you. Yes, Ms. Reed. Thank you so much for all the information you provided, Mr. Warner. Um, just are a lot of the recommendations that you um, gave to us, are they from AIA also? Did they weigh in on, on some of these so that other school districts are doing similar things? Yes. The, uh, this the, We developed our guidelines in conjunction with a number of other districts um, that uh, are doing similar types of things. Every district has a little bit of difference that they do, but um, in terms of the way that we're limiting the groups, the way that we're doing the cleaning, the way that we're um, uh, bringing a gradual, more of a staged uh, approach, those are all very similar all across the valley. Okay, thank you. And then um, I know that in the corporate world, if somebody tested positive for COVID, they would have a cleaning company come in more of like a, I don't want to say hazmat, but more of a very intense cleaning crew that would come in. Are those, do we have contracts as a district in case um, a student had COVID symptoms and, you know, tested positive that we would be able to sanitize the gym like that? Or is that something that we're handling as a district? Um, Ms. Reed, Mr. Miglarino can comment on this as well, but we do have our team, which we call ERAT. And so that team uh, does have the capability to do a deep cleaning. Um, we have uh, equipment that can do uh, cleaning of a very large um, square footage in a very short amount of time. And so um, I think, Mr. Miglarino, you have told me before that we can do an entire school, an elementary school. Um, obviously, the high schools are bigger, uh, but an elementary school could be done in a matter of hours uh, with some of the equipment that we have. And it is automatic um, disinfecting uh, with, with the type of chemicals uh, that they have. Okay. Mr. Miglarino, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, only that uh, the current guidelines uh, actually ask that the space... Uh, remain unoccupied for 24 hours before you even do the disinfecting. So we might have to come up with a plan to vacate the premise uh, before we and ventilate it before we even actually do the disinfecting. Uh, those are recent uh, developments in terms of their guidelines, but we do uh, uh, we do have the capability of doing the sanitation ourselves. Okay. And have and have performed that on a couple occasions already. Okay. Um, and then I know that in in one of the latter stages, I, I think stage two or stage three, you talked about spotters. Um, are there, are we going to limit the amount of weights that our students can use in stage one so that we don't have spotters or yeah, absolutely. guidelines? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it'll be much more um, stretching and, and uh, uh, light repetition or more repetitions with light weights, things like, of that nature. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. And then the last one was just um, with hand washing. I know that, um, that, you had mentioned that there will be signage about hand washing. Um, I would love to make sure our athletes wash their hands before they start and then wash their hands, you know, maybe in the middle and then at the end. That's important. And I know that sometimes with teenage boys, they don't think that washing their hands with soap is, is all that important. But um, <laughs> when they're, but when they're working out, I mean, that's, I, I think it's great that we have hand sanitizer, but the most effective is washing with soap and water for 30 seconds. So hopefully our coaches will um, encourage their athletes to to do that. The coaches, that be for the coaches the girls will be too? back on campus too. You know, so they'll, they'll make sure they do the it. The girls right. too, right? Uh, yes, and know. the girls. I don't want to yeah. be don't want to be sexist. Yes. Thank you. All, all of our athletes. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, so next we will move to curriculum and instruction with Dr. Galligan. President Ordway, members of the board, 
So even in the midst of closing down a, a very different end of our school year, we've, we have already begun to work on different pathways to the next school year. Obviously, our, our hope is that the vast majority of kids would be able to start brick and mortar, and we have plans in place for assessing lost learning, um, providing social-emotional um, activities specific to kids who have developed anxiety or fright because of COVID-19. Um, we've also built in our specific interventions that can start um, fairly immediately. Uh, and then beyond that, we've also looked at our content areas and how we can build prior to each unit of learning um, prerequisite skills that may have not been mastered, um, work on those for a day or two before going into the next unit of learning so that we don't lose current year learning time. That's the goal. We have also begun um, looking at our blended or hybrid model. And when we've looked at that, we've looked specifically, and I'm going to just look at, at what we've already worked on here so far. We've broken it down to um, uh, three, four main areas. So looking at school considerations, teacher and staff considerations. Um, with the blended model, um, there are some other areas that we are, are considering, such as our facilities and procedures, food and nutrition um, with, with blended or hybrid, um, extracurricular and before and after school care, uh, student and staff help, and then that flexibility for our students and staff. When we look at our teachers and staff considerations, we also look specifically at what are our certified teacher needs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute our technology logistics, instructional framework for both uh, students who would um, participate in both a brick and mortar and or potentially an online model, um, our special populations and our more fragile populations. Then we look at our student considerations um, in a blended model and, and how do we uh, provide supports and interventions that are effective for all students. And then for our parent considerations, what would be our at-home um, needs for our parents to understand and um, be responsible for, as well as um, ensuring our student health. So that's, that's where we have begun looking at a blended and hybrid model. When we look at a virtual, um, going back to a virtual model, we know that what we just experienced would not be what a virtual model would look like going into a brand new school year. What we experienced was let's survive and let's do the very best we can in the time that we had left to keep kids engaged and to decrease lost learning. That is not what virtual learning would look like. So in addition to some of the things that I'm going to talk about, we will be pulling a team together to look at what would be best practices at different grade bands for an online virtual model. And just think about kindergarten children who have never experienced online learning and, and their parents and our teachers having brand new babies. So when we think about a, a total virtual model, we will probably not really look to this past spring other than to find what worked and that we can capitalize on. But when we look at a, a completely virtual model um, and we think about our teacher and staff considerations, we're going to have to think about grading, feedback, and reporting very differently than what we did this past spring. We we'll also really have to look at how do we provide that equity for our special populations and our special area programs. Um, we're going to have to really work with our teachers on training and professional development. We gave our teachers some options this past spring that we would more than likely not um, move forward with. So for example, our K-2 teachers had the option to only use their teacher website as a communication tool or to use Google Classroom or Canvas. Going into a full virtual environment, we would have to have everyone use um, our learning management system whether that was through DVOLP or through um, a blend of Canvas or Google Classroom. 
Um, some of the other things we would have to think about in all models would be how would we complete staff evaluations? And even though that's not under my responsibility, when we are looking at different pathways to start the year, we are looking globally at what are the implications, not only for instruction and learning, but for other implications um, for staffing, for operations, for all of those things. Again, technology. Um, when we look at um, the survey, and we'll have a report for you in the COVID report at the next board meeting about the survey results from our stakeholder groups. But for the most part, the technology response from both our parents and students was extremely favorable. Um, so for those, those parents that had the opportunity to have the technology and the Wi-Fi, um, they were very favorable in, in what they were able to accommodate. Again, curriculum needs, and then of course the structural needs in a um, full virtual. So again, we had a very short time period that we expected teachers to work with their kids. Kindergarten for an hour, first through third grade, no more than, I think it was first through fourth grade, no more than two hours, fifth grade, and you can see how we went. If we're going into a brand new school year with brand new content, that would be different. And we would have to, we would have to educate our parents and our teachers on how to effectively teach in a, a true online environment. That would be different than what we had this spring. Again, when we look at our student considerations in a full virtual model, we would be looking at what are those learning expectations? What are the time expectations? Now, the social emotional needs, I can't emphasize as Gary just said, the social emotional needs in any one of the pathways that we are planning for is to be up there as important as the academic learning, just as we go into a new school year. Again, technology uh, would be another thing. And then for our parents in a full virtual, it's just that, that ongoing communication and how we communicate often and carefully. Because if you communicate too often, our parents shut down. So it's being uh, effective in identifying our best practices in communicating with parents in an only virtual environment. And then, of course, our training and support. Then when you look at that last bullet, some brick and mortar and some virtual, well, this is, this is more than likely going to be part of our reality, that we have a chunk of parents who send their kids and a smaller chunk who say, I'm not quite ready yet. What can I do? And we'll probably have a good chunk of our teachers who want to come back and feel comfortable and confident coming back. And then we will have some of our teachers who may have those medical conditions and they may not feel comfortable coming back. However, they signed a contract and we have, a, we have reached an agreement in that contract that they are going to teach and we have a job for them. So that last bullet is, is really going to be where finesse and um, thinking carefully about how we will move forward in that scenario. I think when we think about uh, either a true brick and mortar or a true blended hybrid or a true virtual, none of those are actually going to happen because we are going to have a group of parents who are fearful to send their kids and a group of teachers whose medical conditions may not allow them to feel comfortable and confident. And those are all things that we are considering. So we have always in the last, Jim, I think, 17 years had online learning. Deer Valley was one of the first seven districts in the state to be approved for our e-school. So we have that and we're asking you later tonight to extend that down to kindergarten and we'll be able to leverage that in whatever way we can as well as use our teachers who now may not feel like they are experts but they are far more confident in an online environment than they have ever been before. So those are just some of the things that we are currently working on. Are we finished yet? No. But we have so many ways that we can pull people together to help us um, with these solutions. And then with Dr. Finch and a timeline that's been laid out for us, um, we feel confident that whatever direction we end up going um, we will be able to start it 
um, pretty, pretty clearly. With that said, I want to end with, um, we know that this past spring we had challenges with parents who did who had low tech and no tech and finding solutions to help our low tech no tech parents with their children is going to be one of those most important things for equity we also know that we had parents who felt overwhelmed with multiple children and how to support them if we are in a virtual or even a blended model so those are other considerations that that we're trying to work our way through. The fortunate thing is we can lean on our NEVIC districts because they are in the same place we are and together we can find solutions and together we can communicate a, a fairly close plan across those NEVIC districts. So with, with that said, I, I don't think I answered any questions, but I wanted to, to paint a picture that this is not something we're taking lightly and it's something that we've already begun working toward are those very different pathways to next year. Uh, Mrs. Ordway? Go ahead. Um, so I just had a, uh, would like to thank Dr. Gallivan for that detailed report. And also you mentioned the social emotional supports for students who are feeling anxiety, uh, which I think is so important. So I do have a question. Do you have any emotional uh, social support for board members who are feeling anxiety? <laughs> Just asking for a friend. Oh, come on. We have each other. <laughs> Again, just asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> do you want her to answer that? <laughs> we can find a no, way that, for that. No, that's okay. <laughs> it was yeah. Oh, look. Gary's got an yeah. answer. Is it, we'll have a webinar for that. Yeah. <laughs> Governing okay, boards in the pandemic. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Megalovin. Thank you, everyone, for uh, I know we still have uh, fiscal services to, to go, but thank you to everyone who's presented so far. You're awesome. Thank you. Oh, it's Jim's turn. Jim? Uh, just real quickly, uh, we've been providing the updates on the meal counts. Um, uh, so that information here is well over 372,000 meals that we served over, I think, about a nine week period of time. And uh, but we have made a change, and I just wanted to make sure the board is aware of that. We have moved to the real summer uh, uh, distribution of meals. Um, everything up until this point was actually modified as a result of the pandemic, um, and we did change uh, to we were on Mondays and Thursdays distributing meals. Now we're doing it Tuesdays and Thursdays. So two meals on Tuesday for Tuesday and Wednesday three meals on Thursday, Thursday, Friday, and Monday. Um, we did that in part because of the holiday on Monday uh, yesterday, uh, but also works out better for staffing. Uh, we did have to consolidate uh, three of our locations, and, you know, so they're no longer serving at three locations that we had previously, um, but uh, and, and we haven't we don't have the numbers to see what that's going to look like. Uh, most of the consolidation was due to staffing um, concerns that we had, making sure that we had enough people to actually man those locations, but also uh, a result of what we were experiencing in terms of utilization at a couple of the sites, uh, low utilization, so there's no longer need, a need. Uh, so we continue to operate. This is our plan through uh, the month of June at this point in time. That's as far as we have um, prepared to be able to provide this service uh, and even though that timeline has recently been extended beyond June um, from the federal government uh, we have not developed plans beyond June at this point in time but we will be monitoring that as we look at utilization over the next four weeks well, thank you President Ordway, Governing Board members, in the area of human resources, you're going to see that some of these are repeat items, yet each week that goes by, they become more and more wide. So one uh, new item that we want to mention because we have gained a little bit of ground here is um, the identification of our PPE work team. We had a pre-meeting this uh, afternoon with Gail and her team in preparing for more immediate needs, summer programming. And then tomorrow we'll meet again with a core group of um, uh, stakeholders. So DeVespa will be present, DVEA, BLT, and district representatives. Make sure that we're fully considering what it would look like if we were open and which um, 
employees at what locations would need supplies, where we would get those supplies and, and so forth. So we're working on that. And as we gather information, you'll be briefed um, in that area. Secondly, FFCRA processes, we continue to update those knowing that um, HB 2910 will go away at the end of June and we will need to fully roll into um, all guidelines that are outlined underneath um, those federal guidelines. So we, tomorrow we'll be meeting again to make sure that we have our forms ready to go, our workflows will be in place, and any person or any employee that would be unable to report to work for one of those six reasons would need to take um, a leave under, underneath this law. And then we continue to issue letters to staff, which you will always receive a copy. Gary and I are working together to make sure that everything that we do outline for our programs also includes um, the necessary guidelines for staff. And those are changing regularly. So we do stay in contact downtown and make sure that we update those. We intend to send a new one out in about a week and a half. And then we do um, continue to hold our orientations and onboarding, and we are planning for either a full um, onboarding session or orientation come July or a modified version. So there, the team was planning today to make decisions about what we're going to need to do with all of our new employees come July. Thank you. And with that, President Orderway, our formal presentation has ended. And so if there are any additional uh, questions, we can field those now. Ms. Reed says she has one. Um, and it's not really a question, just more of a thoughtful comment. Um, Dr. Gallion, I know that there have been a lot of um, webinars and um, virtual conferences that um, different associations have been having and um, teachers have been having in regards to what um, the beginning of the school, school year will look like as far as assessments go and um, better understanding where our students are, um, are, are entering their current grade at. And so um, I've just been reading some of the comments from some of the educators and, and they are very concerned that we might be um, over testing the kids at the beginning of the school year and um, not being as um, respectful to maybe some of the, the social emotional trauma that they're bringing along with them. And so um, I, I know that you that that's a concern for you, too, and, and you want to make a um, make sure we have a good balance. Um, so with that being said, have you started to look at kind of what those assessments might be and, and have you been able to um, pull together a stakeholder group of, of teachers to make sure that we're capturing what we need to capture without um, over, over testing our little ones? Absolutely. So when we look at um, the COVID-19 slide, that's a, an article that talks about the lost learning that is more than just a summer slide. Um, we identified the RI and MI for week one um, for grades four through 11. And each of those assessments will take up to one hour. And we identified our normal dibbles um, for grades K3. And dibbles will take anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes um, for that assessment. And then we identified for math um, in week one, for grades, um, I believe it is 4, 11, a module pre-assessment that has three to five questions in it that just looks at the prerequisite skills. So if we were to look at a specific grade level, let's say fourth grade, for that first week, they would have uh, one up to one hour for RI, up to one hour for MI, and about 15 maybe 20 minutes for a three to five question prerequisite test in that module. So we're looking at in that first week about two hours, 20 minutes tops. Now when you balance that with social emotional learning, one of the things that we are also working on and um, Jen Miner and a team from the home learning steering team are going to be pulling together specific um, social emotional activities and tasks that teachers can do by grade level. So we're gonna, we're gonna produce that for grade levels, grade bands, so that in addition to the social emotional programs that a school may already have like 
EQ or All Things EQ or The Leader in Me, um, there will be specific targeted um, SEL tasks or activities. A first grade teacher, a fourth grade teacher, an eighth grade teacher, a high school um, ELA teacher might use that's not necessarily targeted on our general SEL programming, but it's targeted on the, the needs of children who have just experienced a pandemic and a school closure. So we're going to balance those, which is going to take time out of the instructional day, with um, two hours and 20 minutes of assessment in the first week. So we're trying our best to balance those needs and ensure that um, teachers' social emotional needs are also met. Um, they're also going to come back um, worried, scared, happy, excited, um, and need to have um, their needs met as well. But the bottom line is we know that the sooner we can get kids, if we're able to start brick and mortar or even a blended model into intervention, whether it's tier two, tier three, or we're differentiating instruction in tier one, the better able will be able to catch lost learning while also building in those social emotional needs. So our, our goal, and, and I, Scott and his team have been working on all of the schools identifying a evidence-based social emotional program, and that's going to continue. But what we're looking at targeting are social emotional tasks that will really help kids and teachers overcome those, those feelings um, that they have because of that school closure of COVID-19. So I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that when we look at a specific student in a specific grade for that first week, we're looking at no more than two hours, 20, maybe two hours, 30 minutes out of that full week. The goal also is we will have our early release PLC Fridays. And so for August 7th and August 14th, having teachers have current data for the students that they teach is going to be most important because we won't have AZM2, we won't have AIMS, we won't have any number of other assessments that we would have had um, at the end of this current, this past year. So being able to have as much actionable data without over-testing is going to be very important. And we don't believe that out of a full week of children being in school, whether it's brick and mortar or blended, that two and a half hours is an excessive amount of testing. Thank you. And Ms. Reed, I, I would just add to that as well, that the topic that you just surfaced was a topic that Gail and I uh, discussed with the Project Momentum leaders too, because we know we have a close partnership with them. Um, and uh, it is an assessment. Uh, assessment is a big topic uh, for the Project Momentum folks. And so when Gail and I did our Zoom call uh, with them last week, that, that topic, that exact topic was brought up. And so we discussed. Thank you so much. Well, thank you everybody for that very comprehensive in-depth report and for answering our questions. So let's move to, there are no public comments for this meeting. Let's move to for old business, 4A. I recommend that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the FY21 classroom site fund plan. Second. Um, we've discussed this already. Are there any further questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that there's no opposition, so let's go to 4B. Sorry. I, rec I move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the FY21 employee salary schedule. Second. Any discussion? Yes, ma'am. Um, I received an email on this, and I, I sent it to Dr. Finch ahead of time, so I'll just read it to the board because you could hear the questions I got. It said, according to the salary scale, deans are considered campus administrators. Deans are paid teacher salary with same credentials and responsibilities as assistant principals. In many cases, more responsibility to learn, support, and lead to schools. There is a $20,000 discrepancy between deans and AP starting pay. Both must have a master's degree in educational leadership to be hired. If coming from out of district, they are 
only receiving five years teaching credit, which is the same as new teachers coming into DV. Deans get five extra days outside of the contract, which is still not comparative to the starting salary of AP. Principals get a daily rate of 350, which would be $1,750 per week. If deans receive a comparable rate, I doubt it though, that is still a discrepancy of 18250 How much is the daily rate for APs? Why is there such a large discrepancy when they have the exact same job, duties, discipline, evaluate staff, lead PD as assistant principals? Um, the rest of this email would be off topic because it wasn't pertaining to the salary schedule, but the process. We're, we're, so a, I, I, I sent that to Dr. Finch to put in the update, so I'm not going to read that part. No, I don't need you to read it, but was that from an actual person? Yeah. Or So it was signed? Yeah, this is just feedback I received on this. So th I didn't write this. I don't know any of this. No, I didn't mean if you wrote it. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just making sure it was somebody that we could. Yeah, no, I know who the I know who wrote it. I, they just didn't want to be identified. No. So, Dr. Finch, would it be okay if Ms. Moffitt uh, responded to that? The President Ordway, Ms. Tweedy, I don't know if I captured every single question in what you just read, but did Dr. Finch forward it to you? Because he said he would. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, for context first. When the salary schedule, we didn't have Dean in the former fa salary schedule, and we now have added it. And one of the reasons we wanted to add it is because it is it comes out of administrative funding, as you know. It is not a teacher on assignment as we viewed it many, many, many years ago. It is turned in to an administrative position that does require the credentials that uh, a principal or an assistant principal would have. It is also why we shifted the name to be Dean rather than teacher on assignment so that there was not confusion. So the, the formula that we use to hire a teacher is not the same formula that we use to hire uh, an administrator. So I'm not exactly sure whoever made this comment where they're gathering their information. That is one of the reasons why we wanted to shift it over to the administrative scale. We, it has um, always started with the teacher's salary. However, um, it does require a master's degree. So we added, uh, if you recall the board update a couple of weeks back, we added what um, would be considered to be the educational credit to that. We can honor years of service. And we also want to make sure that we are honoring the level of responsibility that this position comes with. And in our district, that uh, standardly has been a 5% increase for a level increase uh, of administrative responsibility. So that does give us that flexibility. What um, Dr. Finch referenced in the last governing board meeting and the struggle that we do have, certainly, is when we have a teacher that has been in our system for a period of time, long enough to make a, a, a nice salary, uh, is then decides that they would like to be an administrator and whether that be an assistant principal or a dean we have found ourselves in this year in a struggle because when we hire a, a teacher to become a dean their salary is over the starting rate of an assistant principal even so um, that's why we we put in when when jim and i talked about what this would look like <clears throat> the five percent pay increase for responsibility because that is, again, standard practice. So that's just some background and clarity as to why we shifted it and put it in the salary schedule under administration. As far as um, summer pay, as long as I've, I have been in human resources, $350 is the summer rate paid to a principal. Two years ago, cabinet approved the rate for an assistant principal or a dean to be at $300. And so the daily rate is a very different number than what a summer rate would be. And assuming that whoever made this comment is referencing summer rate, daily rate would be your base rate divided by your number of days worked and everyone's is different based on their what their contractual rate is. Um, I, I recall... Uh, task. Uh, task between an assistant principal uh, and... Yes, yes. Okay. So this was if, um, a, a handful of years back when we requested to bring deans on board or many more 
on board at the K-6 level. Uh, the committee put the recommendation in place. This was a, a committee of district administrators, campus administrators, and then it was um, put forward to NST and came forward uh, that year, as you may recall. The committee decided um, at that time that a dean would be at the K-6 level and it would be differentiated from an assistant principal at a K-8, um, mostly because of the seven and eight, the responsibilities that come with the seventh and eighth grades. So clubs, sports, evening activities, um, that at the time was the justification for the differentiation. We also see, just so you know, and, and probably why Dr. Finch mentioned it last time, we do see a need to take a look at this and, and address it. We do see that when we compare ourselves to other districts, they have things like TOAs and deans as well, um, but that our starting rates uh, could use a review. I just had a few questions. Just a couple of questions. So a point of clarification. If you hired a teacher with five years experience and a dean with five years experience and they both had master's degrees, what would be the difference in their pay? The difference in the pay would be a 5% increase above that for responsibility. So the, the dean would make 5% more than the teacher? That's right. Okay. Is there a $20,000 discrepancy between the starting pay of a dean and the starting pay of an AP? I believe there is, yes. Mm, okay. It's right here. So you're, do you think the clubs and activities are $20,000 more work? If that's the main difference between these two jobs, I, I guess I'm trying to understand that's that. That's my personal opinion. It just, it seems like a large difference. <laughs> Uh, you're you're right, and and but that that indeed was the decision made by the committee at the time, and again, why we well, we would like to take a look at it. Mr. Miglarino, would you like to add something to that? Uh, President Orway, Ms. Tweedy, I think one thing to note: um, there is a different number of paid days in the two contracts. Uh, the dean contract is 201 days, and the AP contract is uh, uh, paid for 226 days. So there's a difference of 25 paid days. So what appears to be like a 41% difference uh, between the starting rate really ends up being about a 25% difference uh, when you do it on a daily rate basis. It, it, there is still a difference, uh, and I would note it's pretty sizable. Daily rate, 304 to 242 um, uh, on the daily rate based on the number of contract paid contract days in each of those agreements. Uh, and that's really kind of a carryover from the TOA contract. So the TOA contract was a teacher contract with additional days on it. Uh, and that's calculated differently than the administrative contract, which is kind of a 12 month contract backed off for, uh, for weeks that they don't work over the summer. So um, they're calculated two different ways. So this would be something that um, BLT and uh, NST mm -hmm. um, could, should look at for our next go round? Uh, yes, and I'd also um, add, I think the, the person that emailed said that there were five additional days and it, it's uh, well over five additional days that they work. So, and, and just to get your perspective before we vote, is this something that cannot be addressed this year by striking that salary only off this recommendation? It needs to wait till next year? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I, my, I'll weigh in on here. Um, it went through the committee process, and I'm a process guy. So uh, I get nervous when we start making changes um, to a system without it running through the machine because we inev inevitably make a mistake and it comes back to haunt us, haunt us because we have um, unintended consequences. So I think the right move is to give it, to punt it to NST and to BLT and have them arm wrestle over it and do some actual research around all what our neighbors have. And just so we make sure we land on a good number that would make sense rather than try to make up a number tonight. Jim, you are in the meetings. I don't know if this has ever come up in the meetings, but 
Um, I, I think there's been a lot of discussion about starting rate and uh, what we've referred to as leapfrogging, you know, where we mm -hmm. have uh, positions that are leapfrogging. I think the reality of this, and Ms. Moffitt can speak to this better than I, um, is that we're probably not going to hire a dean at that beginning rate, nor an assistant principal at that beginning rate, because that would be a brand new person that would, you know, fit into that role. Um, they're probably not, that's probably not likely to happen. Uh, what's more likely to happen is that we're going to end up with an existing employee that's ready to make a transition. And so we're going to use their current salary and modify it by 5% and make sure that it, it is in alignment so with, okay. um, with other salaries in that range. So there's a different calculation. This is the hiring schedule. So uh, this would assume a brand new person with no experience would be fit for one of our dean positions. Um, I, I think that's probably unlikely. Ms. Moffitt might be able to speak to that better than I. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I think because we have been fortunate to give some um, some healthier pay increases than we had in previous years, we are finding our, ourselves in this position more than we did previously. So uh, we do hire people who don't have administrative experience in the dean and the assistant principal role. But what Jim, I think, is referencing is that it is, it is before it was more common to hire people that were newer to the educational profession overall. So there was a gap between their current earning and the starting rate of what we would hire um, a dean at. And now we aren't finding that uh, as often. So right now, if you had, a, let's just say, a teacher that got their administrative um, certifications they were making $54,000, you would hire them at $54,000 plus 5% or something along, correct? Yes. They wouldn't go back to the that is right. 48. Okay. That is right. Ms. Reed? So is it possible to do a, a salary study per se for us to where you can give us some examples of, you know, obviously leave the name out, but, you know, Dean A, B, and C, mm -hmm. you know, low, middle, high. Um, and I know that we have quite a few new deans that are coming in and coming in from out of um, district. So maybe even, you know, giving us some examples of that, that would be very helpful in a Friday update. Thank you. All right, are we ready to vote? Is that yes? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 And there is no opposition. And where did my voting rights go? There they are. Okay, consent agenda. I move that the governing board approve the consent agenda items 5A five 5I. Five Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes by all 6A student travel. I move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the student travel. Second. I'm sorry, second. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, I said second. Oh, I was okay. just waiting. Okay. I mean, we've had so much discussion. Did we need any further discussion? Um, knowing that whatever student travel we will approve is um, subject to whatever it's subject to in the best interest of the kids, correct? All those in favor say aye. 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 And that also is, or there are also no opposition. So moving to 6B. Oh, wait a minute. It didn't pop up yet, Sheila. We're trying to be good. Oh, well, awesome for that. Uh, let's go to 6B then. I move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the addenda as presented. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ha, we beat you, Sheila. Six C. Um, President Ordway, members of the board, 
I, I, this is probably the best front loaded agenda item in the history of a board meeting. But either as you vote or before I ask if you have any other questions, I just wanted to give some recognition. We found out last week, as you've heard Dr. Finch say and Dr. Galligan, we were one of the original online programs back when it was called TAPI. Yes. And back when it was the TAPI program, it was a completely different application. And so when we reached out to the State Board of Education office to find out exactly what we needed to do in order to add grades K through five and, and make sure we have our ducks in a row, um, the wonderful staff there who responded very quickly, uh, considering the avalanche of email they must have right now, uh, they provide us with the 13 section, 18 page application. And I forwarded 13? it immediately to Dr. Galligan and Dr. Christy Hirschberg. And I asked them, please, if we could get this completed in about a week, I would like us to be one of the first to get the application submitted. The application window opened last Tuesday and is open through July 1st. And I said, if you could get it done in about a week and within 24 hours, the application was about 80% done. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, extraordinary job by Dr. Galligan, Dr. Hirschberg, Mr. Jeff Anderson, Trevor from HR has helped as well. Everyone has just done an amazing job so that when you vote yes, that we can get this application in as soon as possible and have all of the options that we need for our students. Wow, that is front loaded. Gee, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> any discussion? Well, Heather Mock. Hmm. All those in favor? I have to move. Oh. Aye. Hold on, wait one second. I move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to apply with the State Board of Education to add kindergarten through eighth to our online learning program. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That was a very loud and, and lovely aye. And she's out for rent if anyone else needs her. <laughs> From their staff. Oh, look at that. We're on seven and somebody whispered that they need a clicker. Preferably one that works, right? Okay, President Ordway, Governing Board members, Dr. Finch, tonight I get to present to you the first read of the tentative agreement, certified and classified. The certified team you see here, uh, that would be me, Dr. Miller, Maria Leva, Kelly Fisher, and Kim Crooks. We met all throughout this year um, to review language and present to you what you will see this evening. Classified group, Trevor, Hillary, Jay, Steve and Amy. We'll start with the certified negotiation changes. First in, whoop, did I go to? Yes, I did. Okay, first off in section eight, and if you want to look at your tentative agreement, I might reference it if you have it in front of you. In section eight, you'll see that um, there is a number five under A, public criticism. This section, if you recall, we shared with you last year that we obtained an attorney opinion of this area, and it was um, uh, Dr. or I'm sorry, Denise Lilbritz's um, opinion provided that we again reviewed this year. We paused at the end of last year, discussed it further this year, and it is our recommendation that what we put in place of current language is instead the administrator will ensure that another DVUSD administrator is present during the interview process. This was probably the area of the tentative agreement that required the most discussion. I did participate in the DVEA executive board meeting to um, explain what processes we do use around student interviewing when it comes to certified employee investigations and what avenues they do have when there are points of concern. Um, and so we thought the best thing, it was their request and the administrative side agreed that we insert instead that an administrator be present with another administrator when conducting this interview. I did also um, highlight or point out that we never want to interview a student in isolation. 
um, but we did agree that another administrator who also has the accountability, as um, Ms. Lowell Britt pointed out, is necessary and there the administrator is held liable and obligated to the process that it would be appropriate to have another administrator present during that interview. So that's why you see the language um, outlined there. The next section, section 20, these are all around professional com compensation. If you recall, um, year after year after year after year, we have had a rate of $16 per hour for extra duty pay and homebound pay, which has caused over time um, difficulty in us being able to find people that will perform some of these duties at that rate. Other rates we have increased. As you know, minimum wage has gone up. We've adjusted accordingly. So the team worked at reviewing all the rates that we do offer and came up with what they believe to be the most appropriate rate for the um, extra duty and for homebound services, and that is at the $25 per hour rate. They also took a look at um, information that Dr. Chunis collected around National Board, and, and we comped um, what we paid previously, which was $1,000, and the team, which one member of that team is a nationally board certified teacher, that's Kelly Fisher, agreed that $1,800 would be an appropriate amount for us to offer our National Board teachers. And as a reminder to you, this is an addenda that we pay to the teacher that holds this certification for the duration each year that they do hold it. And um, if you recall too, Dr. Chunis presented a um, national board overview this last year where she shared that we compensate or provide some support to those that are going through the process where we previously did not. So that's also helpful to these that are seeking that certification. Mm -hmm. We also, um, there was a request to add a cross-country coach to our K-8 campuses. The majority of the K-8 campuses are already running a cross-country um, sport or team and are following the non-IBM process, which you approve it at, um, in, a, in a different way. So their request, can we please add a coach like we have for other sp sports at the K-8 level? The team was agreeable and this coach, if you approve, would be paid at the same rate as the other coaches at K-8 campuses. Additionally, under this section, the team agreed that uh, to change the way that we charge DVEA for the release time for the president. So over time, the formula has indicated that we would charge a 75% of who uh, the contract rate of whoever the president was. And we agreed that instead what we would do is charge the average teacher's salary. And that average teacher's salary would be provided by the business office. So Heather would provide that. And that's the same report that we give to the attorney general for, is that right? For, go ahead. Uh, president and rate members of the board, uh, Ms. Moffat, I think uh, they were referencing the Auditor General report. Yes. That the report actually that the Auditor General gives us from the prior year. Or. Jim? Uh, because we've got it in about. <laughs> nice it gets published in about three different places. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that would be the report. It's AG, Attorney General or Auditor General. <laughs> I, I, I thought we had agreed that we were right. going to use the right. average that's on the proposed and adopted budget on the cover page of the proposed and adopted budget. But, um, and that, that number we calculate, the number from the AG report, the Auditor General calculates. So either one, uh, we just need to know which one. They, they should be. Are they the same? The, they're not identical. Uh, they well, wouldn't be identical because they're calculated two different ways. And the Auditor General doesn't provide all the details. They consider that to be part of their working document. Uh, some of the auditor general report um so but they're very comparable to each other we're talking within you know hundreds of dollars difference yeah. and i would just add that the auditor general report is about a year behind so if we were using that calculation it would be 75 percent of the average salary probably from two fiscal years prior because that report doesn't come out till march of this year for last year 
And then it would be for so, the next year. So it'd be a couple of years behind. That so we're going to be using our information. Correct. We're not waiting. We using our information. Okay. That was one of the reasons why they wanted this report so that it would be timely and not delayed. So it'll be current. Correct. And then one, one question I have is um, how, how are the benefits paid? How are the benefits paid? Who pays for them? And how's that? What's the proportion on benefits? I'll defer that question to Mr. McGlivino. Or I can answer other. that. We actually, the entire salary goes through our payroll system. We invoice um, DVEA for that 75% of the salary. And the invoicing system that we've been using has been um, the salary only and had not included benefits. So it's just based off of the salary. So we're paying 100% for benefits for... Okay. Um, hmm. That's interesting. Just, just wondering, has that ever been brought up? Well, I know I brought it up a while ago, but is it ever brought up how the benefits are paid? Um, it has not. It has never been discussed um, while I have been on NST, and I was on NST as a uh, building level principal as well. So no, that's never been brought up during. All right, it's just something to think about. Would you okay. like them to discuss it next year? Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's already gone through, so or okay, almost gone through. All right, go ahead. I'm okay. I'm ready to go to the next red line. All right, so the next section is from the classified team. So under section 17, you'll see that on the document that you have, there are just some clerical things that they decided to adjust under section 17. So I moved um, the slide straight to section 18. Mm -hmm. And what they added under section 18 is a clarification for three hours for the quarterly um, um, turn in uh, of their 1A forms. So there was just seemed to be some regular confusion of uh, the amount of hours that they could turn in at different times to equal the 12 hours that they needed for the compensation. So they just put in three hours in order to be more clear about what was necessary. Because if you see in the language, they can turn it in in, in a quarterly fashion. Section 19, they are recommending that we remove replacement IDs will be charged to the employee. We do not do that. Um, if someone needs a new employee, a new badge, we make the new badge. For That's them. awesome because some of them need a new one. Because we're nice. <laughs> Jim probably needs a new one. <laughs> Where's your badge, Jim? I'm sorry. Go ahead. And then lastly, Appendix M. We um, are recommending that we adjust the language to match the compress compression changes mm -hmm. to the schedule that you all approved during the last governing board meeting. And you'll also see that there's an example and they adjusted that example to follow those changes so that if an employee were to be hired into a new position that would require a pay increase, it would be um, calculated at the new rates. And then also, um, they're recommending updated language around the NST process. You'll see, I think it's letters, if I remember off the top of my head, there's a, a letter B and a, a letter D that indicate that, um, that it would be 50% of the increase would be the flat rate and the 50% of the increase would be at um, a percentage rate. And so they're recommending instead that we follow what we have over the last few years and that that would be at the recommendation of the NST team rather than tied to what they had in language similarly to what the certified group was hoping to do. So when we leave that language in there we continue to um, move the or not move the needle to have people catch up and leapfrog and and all that stuff if we leave that in there correct? Potentially although it still does leave them at 50-50 rather than any other right. percentage split. And because we have made alternative decisions over the last handful of years, they, are, um, they would rather have generic language included that allowed for the board perhaps to provide different direction at the beginning of a year when we go into negotiations and it wouldn't be 
directly tied to what's in language. Okay. Anyone have questions on any of it? I do want to point out that um, the by our next meeting, our hope is that we can report that this has been ratified. As I shared with you, I did meet with the executive board um, on the certified side. However, because of the COVID closure, they did have some difficulties going through their typical processes. And so they will update us um, in the next week or so. In, in a Friday update or however, I mean, I guess today's Tuesday, so Friday would be okay. If we could have the value of the benefit um, that we were paying for the uh, DVA president would be awesome. And I think that was... I think that was the only question I have, anyway. Ms. Frank, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, I, I just, I, I wasn't forgetting, but no one else was talking, so I wanted to make sure that I, I mentioned you again, in case you thought we weren't thinking of you. I'm here, I have no questions. Okay. You have right. me to thank for that. I'm in charge of the technology. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Reed? So for, um, could we also get the um, amount that we are currently paying the DVEA president so we can compare between this year and next year since the um, salary is different. Thank you. All right, so I think um, we can go to 7B. Uh-oh, Gary needs a clicker. <laughs> Go. Finch. Okay, President Orderway, members of the board, Dr. Finch, uh, tonight we are bringing forth proposed language revisions for Policy JII in this first read. Policy JII deals with the reporting of student concerns, grievances, and complaints. These proposed revisions are a result of a recent OCR audit of CTE programming at Mountain Ridge High School. Uh, to be clear, Mountain Ridge was not targeted for this audit because of any violation. Rather, it was selected for the audit on the basis of the school meeting various criteria regarding student enrollment and demographics. The proposed revisions that you will see here tonight were provided by legal counsel. The Cartwright School District um, also went through a similar audit last year and had the same finding and so legal counsel provided the language revisions that were accepted by uh, OCR uh, for the exact same finding and then adopted by that governing board. So in short the OCR determined that our policy as is in its current form lacked adequate timelines and instructions on reporting. And so here are the four bullet points capturing the substantive changes. First, the current version includes language about harassment, bullying, and intimidation. Uh, the updated language directs those matters to be dealt with in policy JICK, which you probably recall because we just recently went through revisions and adoption of um, updated language by you. Second, the proposed language states that a student can report um, a I can alert any staff member, excuse me, um, instead of only an administrator or a professional staff member as it is uh, currently stated. It also goes on to provide the timeline for that and states that that person has five days to alert an administrator uh, upon receiving the report. Third, it states the administrator has five days to complete the complaint form and that complaint form asks the student to describe the problem, provide the details um, of the problem, add if there were others that can provide information into the problem, and also ask for solutions. Finally, the fourth bullet point states 
that a parent can initiate the process for any student. This is different than our current um, policy as uh, currently only a parent of an elementary student can initiate the process. So that captures the uh, substantive policy um, revisions for policy JII, and that's our first read. Thank you. Are there any questions? No questions? Ms. Reed, do you know what that means? That the future dates are posted, and I move that we adjourn the meeting. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And then it's goodbye. Thank you.